All right, here we go. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida. This is a Black History special. Topic of discussion is community service, community activism. And I have three awesome, wonderful people. They all celebrities. Everybody in the city knows them. They're so famous. I'm, I'm just so honored to, to, to have them on this evening. I have Dr. Jay Macklin from the Academy of Peace, longtime community activist and mentor, Mr. Larry Moore, Morris. And I also have One Village Alliance, Sandra Pitts. Everyone, good evening. And thank you for being a guest on tonight's program. Thank good you. Evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, okay, so we'll start off with uh, Dr. J. Dr. J, if you could just give a brief summary of um, what is a cavity of peace and uh, what is it that you do and how'd you go about uh, creating it? Well, you know, a lot of people ask that question and thank you for allowing me to, to share on that because the name of it is actually the Academy for Peace in that our mission and purpose is to promote peace from the inside out. And the Academy is an outgrowth of Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated that was started in 2001. Can you believe this is our 20th year? Wow. And I'm happy to say that I'm still on the uh, forefront, cutting edge, along with Chandra and Larry, doing the work that it takes to bring peace. And peace is possible. And because I believe that, that is the end we work toward. But of course, like anything else, it comes with struggle, it comes with strategy, and it comes with strength of conviction. And I think that's why after 20 years, Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated is still active. Now, how did we get to be the Academy for Peace? Mm -hmm. Realizing that, uh, Peace is powerful, but it takes purpose. We wanted to look at ways to engage the community in effective peace promotion. So in 2017, and I have to say uh, a big thank you to Larry Morris, who at that time was a go between the governor and uh, Stop the Violence Coalition. He invited the governor in 2017 to come and open the Academy for Peace. And so here we are today, three years later with the opening of the Academy for Peace, but 20 years for Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated. Thank you for asking. That's awesome. Uh, Mr. Morris, I mean, you, you've, you've been around, uh, you've, uh, you've been involved with NAACP and some, uh, maybe some other organizations. You wanna talk about some of the organizations that you were involved with? Well, um, when I first brought, uh, came into community work, some of the people that were uh, very active in the community was, of course, Hicks Anderson, um, uh, Senator Holloway, Lewis Redding, um, almost, <laughs> almost a, all the people who are buildings are named after, uh, uh, Lenny Williams and uh, 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 Arlene Chambers and so forth, uh, you know, all of them were ac active in the community and they were a very good role model. So I, but that's how I began. I, I, uh, I started working with the NAACP Youth Council. Uh, 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 Jim Seals was the president at that time in the middle seventies. And he asked me to direct a, or create the youth council. So we started there. Um, uh, maybe 15 years later, I became the president of the NAACP branch. Um, I've just been a part of many, uh, blessed to be a part of many different organizations who, who, uh, whose direct motives were, were genuine towards making the community better. Right. Okay, and last but not least, Sandra Pitts, I am the village. Uh, wow, I mean, uh, what, what a journey. <laughs> It has been a journey. I love the, this intergenerational coming together of, of leaders. And I'm so honored to be in this space with all three of you. Brother Omar, you supported us since the very beginning. Um, we've been on your couch and you've, I mean, every <laughs> event, 
all of our work. Um, as I listen to you, Dr. J, who is not only one of my mentors, but my Shiro, um, 20 years for you, we've just completed 10 years. So I'm on your heels, but your greatness continues to inspire me, Larry. Morris, the the infamous, you've just been um been there since the beginning with me as well. So as I hear you talk about, you know, great leaders like Lewis Redding and Hicks Anderson, a lot of time we don't recognize the greatness of our um our black history makers while they're here. And Larry and Dr. J and, and Brother Omar, I think that you're all leaders that our generation and the generations coming after you will you'll be a part of, you're already a part of my success and my, my coming into who I am. So, so you're the great leaders of today. And Larry, you are one of our um, honorees, our very first Raising Kings Be Him honoree, Black History in the Making. So I'm just, um, I'm honored to be here. I'm the president and CEO of an organization that I founded. It's, it started as an education agency. It's grown into a global social justice organization because advocacy and just that fight for justice, unfortunately, is something that we have to fight for. Um, I tell our youth all the time, you know, justice, love, they're interchangeable. And these are things we shouldn't have to fight for, but, but public policy advocacy and that social justice movement is such a big part of our work. Um, our mission is to grow historically marginalized youth um, and their families into true greatness through education, entrepreneurship, and the arts. So um, we just completed 10 years and are moving into our 11th year. Um, and this year, even well, in 2020, during a pandemic, we've been so blessed. Um, the, the people who have made a stand and continue to stand with us, even through a global pandemic and who have recognized that you know, we're working with a population, a community, communities of people who um, for them, the state of emergency started long before March. Um, so we've been able to not only continue to serve, but really level up in the revenue, our funders, our partners, our supporters, really excited. Speaking of black history and legacy, UAME is the very first um, independent um, black church in the nation. It was founded by freedom fighter and activist uh, Peter Spencer. And it's now um, that the, the global headquarters for um, UAME, which is located right in Wilmington, Delaware at 31st and Market is now the headquarters for One Village Alliance. We're bringing that space um, to life, you know, there's many churches and, um, but this is just a, a headquarters building and it's now become the very first black owned cooperative um, workspace in the state of Delaware and the first community-based, um, you know, uh, social justice center. So we're really excited about the work we're doing from, you know, the Delaware Valley to West Africa where we have 240 schools there that are operating with our Girls Can Do Anything in Raising Kings programs. Man, that's Amen. Awesome. Amen. You know, you, you have to have a very special heart and desire to, to, to do what the two, three do in terms of uh, providing community services. I want to stay with Sandra, then move on with Dr. J and, and Mr. Larry Morris. Um, why did you decide to, to uh, gear your career in terms of uh, providing community services? For me, it was definitely a calling. I mean, our experiences shape us. So, you know, when you hear about people turning pain into purpose, when I was young, I had, um, you know, I had a lot of great assets and, and a, a really loving family, but it took a whole village to enable me to thrive in life. But I also had, there were some real challenges. Um, in school, we dealt with uh, racism from our neighbors. We were surrounded by all white boys who would leave feces on our, our front step and just, um, you know, um, the bullying and brutalization and racism that we were surrounded by, not just from the kids in the neighborhood, but we, when we went to school. Um, I'm a first generation Mexican American and a black woman, but just growing into your identity as who you are and seeing the difference in how teachers and, you know, predominantly white schools, um, how your self image, image is shaped. If you don't have those really strong, powerful messages at home, a lot of you know my mother, and my father, so we did have those strong um, messages of greatness, but there's so many youth for whom no one ever tells them of their greatness. And um, 
it's I was watch I had for Valentine's Day weekend I had all of my five nieces and nephews over we watched Black Panther again and it's just that that one most powerful line in that movie is you know tell them who you are and we have to continue to show our children who we are tell them who we are so that they may know who they are they are the next generation of of Dr. King like leaders and and they are black history in the making as our way so yeah, Dr. J? Yeah, Chandra, it's interesting that you will say, tell them who you are. That's the very reason I continue to keep the nonprofit status of Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated uh, active after 20 years, because there was a group, and you know the name, Reverend Dr. Maurice J. Yes. who was one of the founding members, along with Pravi Powell Jr., Joyce Powell, many, many other leaders. You know, it takes a village. It takes the entire community. But one thing that Reverend Dr. Maurice J. Moore, your great civil rights leader here in Delaware, told me many, many times, he'd say, daughter, tell the story. Tell the story. And so here it is, 20 years, and I'm still telling the story of the mission of Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated, which is, it just came out of a group of concerned citizens who rose up during a time when we had such a horrific thing to happen in Wilmington with the murder gangland slaying of little Damon Giss Jr., five years old in the barbershop, along with the target of the shooter, uh, Mr. Evans, who was 21 at the time. And from that, you can remember that it became national news. And we came together with clergy, business people, schools, you name it, the entire community. And out of that, our mission became, as a group of concerned citizens, our mission is simply this, to recreate a safe community by promoting respect and positive values. And that has been the story and the mission for me these 20 years, but it didn't just start there for me. As a little girl growing up on the east side of Wilmington in the old Swedes area, we had a wonderful history of growing up in a wonderful neighborhood, I thought, uh, but it wasn't without the ills of society. But a long time ago, it came to me, as Chandra just said, it's, it has to be a calling. It must be a calling because you can't stick with it because it becomes very painful. But many years ago, I felt the need as a little black girl growing up on the east side of Wilmington to not grow up to make a living, but to make a giving. And that's what I do. I do it with my time, my talent, my resources, making a giving so that others can have a better living. It takes that kind of diligence and, and enthusiasm, really, the joy of the challenge of what you're doing, your mission, your purpose. And so I just really thank God for people like Chandra and uh, Mr. Morris who have been very, very supportive. Uh, and of course, you are always there allowing us to share and tell the story. Absolutely. So thank you for allowing us to continue to tell the story because that's very important. <laughs> Our children need to know that they're valuable, they have purpose, 
and that there is a history that will catapult them into their legacy. Absolutely. They'll choose this life work of civic mindedness. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Morris, <laughs> you gotta follow that. You gotta, you gotta follow that. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> um, well, what was the reason why you decided to get involved in community services? I, I have to concur with the other two distinguished panelists that um, this is a calling. It I, is a calling. I, there, have been, <laughs> there have been people who, who have gotten into community uh, activism and, and promotion and so forth for the wrong reasons, and they don't last mm. because it's hard. It's hard and it's thankless sometimes. And, and um, it's not something that you will get rich off of. And mm. so it, it, it has to be a calling, it has to be a love. I, I, I know that um, I'm a spiritual person and, uh, and I believe that, 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 that God has, when you're born, God has a plan for all of us. And then he, um, because he's a loving God, he, he wires you with what's necessary for you to be successful at your plan. Yes. Depending on, depending on the degree of your plan, he won't let you interfere with that. So I'm from Bridgeton, New Jersey. Sandra. <laughs> yes, I always forget um, that, Larry. And, um, yes. So I came, I came to Delaware to go to business school at Goldie Beacom. And Goldie Beacom was at 10th and Jefferson. Okay. I, I wasn't that motivated academically in high school. Goldie Beacom was like one of the only ones that sent me something and accepted me. Okay, so I come to Delaware on academic probation. And because of the nature of my application, I had to live in the YMCA. Wow. So why I was, while I was in the YMCA, within months of being in this business school, I'm thinking, this is crazy. I, I don't really want to do debits and credits and things like that. I, I'm, I'm going to be lost. And then, so I lived in the Y. So I'm seeing inner city kids come in and out of the Y. And then when I'm doing what 19-year-old college students do late at night in the inner city, <laughs> out in the street, I see these little kids out there and I began to, you know, feel for them and wonder where is their moms? Now, 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 and I say that to say that my mom raised me and my three brothers and she didn't play anything. We had more rules and regulations than I think that any of my friends had. And so I rebelled against all that the whole time I was growing up. But, but now I'm on my own and I'm wondering why these children don't have a structure like I had. So I began to, and, and then, then so okay, my mom has all these rules and regulations. There's no way I wanted to go back home that, that following summer. I was offered a job in the YMCA, working with children. And I've been doing that ever since. And it's, and it's, and it's something that's, it's heartbreaking at times. And, and there, there are people that you wanna help that don't get it and you're not able to help them. Um, there, are, there are people who throw stones at your work, throw stones at you, and they, it, it just becomes, um, it's, it's hard, but it's very rewarding. You know, on the other side, it's very rewarding. If that's what you're called to do, you can't do anything else. There's no way you could get away from it. There have been jobs that I've had that I, I, I've been saying to God, I, I say to God, come on, God, I need a real job. I, 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 remember on, I, I, I need a real job, you know? <laughs> and and he, he likes saying, well, sorry. And, and, and some of those jobs where I was hardly getting paid at all are the jobs that turned out to have the biggest impact on some of the young people who are now adults. So, and then again, like I said, there were, there were I had really good role models. Uh, there, were, there was Hicks. One of my first 
uh, uh, okay. Thank you. We got a little stale for a minute, so we'll we'll, we'll, we'll come back, Mr. Morris. Um, but he's mentioned. Uh, jump in oh, where sure, go ahead. he was leaving off. Um, I can remember uh, with Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated when it first started. One of the things that uh, became clear to me is that it must continue because. I don't know. Go ahead, Larry. Okay, Mr. Moore, you, you, you got cut off a little bit, so. Um, Larry, you're, you're your, on, your mute is on, Larry. Touch, you're hit on your mute. mute. Unmute. Mr. There you Moore. go. So my role models were, were primarily men who were doing community work. Um, one of my first bosses was Floyd Casson, uh, the twin brother of Lloyd Casson who unfortunately passed away several years ago. Floyd was such a strong, dynamic black man. We were just in awe. I mean, we learned something from Floyd every day. And while I was working for Floyd, Jim Seals became the president of NAACP. And then and Lewis, I've, had, I've been in meetings with Lewis Redding and certainly with Senator Holloway. And, 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 and so I've had, and Hicks, oh my gosh, Hicks was, Hicks Anderson was, <laughs> Was we'd have a, we could have do a whole show on Hicks Anderson. Hicks Anderson was brilliant. Yeah. He was so brilliant. He had a he had an alter ego that made the people that that where he was trying to fight against. They were scared to death of Hicks. Mm. <laughs> Tactics was I mean I've been with Hicks and I'm like oh my gosh we're not gonna get out of here. But Hicks would Hicks would was very very effective. So I had very good role models. And, and mentors, and, and, and now I see, now that I can look back, you reach a certain age where you can look back and see what you learned and who you learned it from. And here's, here's a point too, I'm sorry I'm taking up a lot of time. I learned stuff from people who didn't know I was watching them. Exactly. They didn't know that. And much of who I am are, are bits and pieces of these different people that I was watching from a distance. So consequently, I had to come to the realization that there are people who are watching me that I don't know, that I don't know is watching me. So I, I have to govern my activities and my behavior and my language and everything appropriately. So those people, those young people that are coming up to want to be community activists or, or, or whatever, you know, there are people who are watching me and, and I learned that from my mentors. Right. Okay, Dr. J, you were, uh, you were saying something earlier. Did you want to finish your thoughts? Uh, no. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, well, well let, me, let me ask this question. Then let me ask this question. Um, all three of you mentioned the youth. Um, and when you work with the youth, I mean, I admire those who work with the youth. It's not an easy task because not only you're dealing with the youth. Oh, that's what I was going to say. You, you prodded my memory. And yeah, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I was going to say, piggybacking on what uh, Larry was saying. When we start out with this work, a lot of people may say it's, you know, you, you have a name, it shows up in the newspaper, or you do great things, you're in a magazine, or whatever the case may be. But when Stop the Violence Coalition came into play, there were deaths. And I'm sure Larry, especially being around my age, will remember that we were looking at a hundred young people dying in a short period of time due to gun violence. And one of the things that Stop the Violence used to do was to go to every funeral. And so you have to have a heart to do it because compassion and caring about the people, it, it's real, mm -hmm. it's real and it becomes a part of you. And I began to say, if we save one life, our mission was not in vain, even if one life was saved. And so it became worth it. And there were many, many, many people 
who sewed into the work, who participated in the movement, who walked the streets with us, uh, you know, SeaTac, um, Churches Take a Corner, all of that was a relevant movement for that time and is still necessary today. And so, yeah, all of us working together is important. It's important because we're in the same vineyard. Right. And the harvest is great. So go ahead, Sandra. Brother Omar, I just wanted to thank you for that, Dr. J. Larry, you said so much, you know, yeah, that, and you, you know, I love it, Omar, because you always bring us into these conversations. So one, Larry, I have a question. When is your book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is a, is a crazy thing because I can, I can help people all day long and I can talk for people all day long. But when it's time to talk about me, I have. I want to help you. We, we got to get that reluctance. book out. Yeah, oh, that man, book it is a, it is, it is really, um, it's going to be something when it comes out. It, just to hear the testimony of some of the people that I knew when they were kids. Absolutely. Well, Jerry, not, Jerry not, Dorsey, not, Jerry Dorsey was in my day camp. <laughs> not that you're not a young man, but we are not going to let you leave this earth with that book. You got to leave that you. here. So I'll, I'm going to make sure I help you. The, now the other thing is, and Omar, I heard you, you know, say, you know, speak directly to the youth. One thing that I want to share, and I think we need to say this to adults and youth, you know, this work, activism, um, you know, the fact that we have been chosen for this life of great purpose to be ambassadors for justice, for children, for families who have been marginalized and left behind for so long. This is not just 501c3 IRS nonprofit work. I want to, you know, kind of like, th there's a misnomer that you have to start a nonprofit organization in order to do this work or even work for a nonprofit organization. Um, you know, so that's one thing. And I want to address that. The second thing, it's also a misnomer. And I know generations before us, you would just see that mama bear in the community or somebody sweeping the steps or that woman who was always there you know, for the children or that man who was always there mentoring generations, um, Mr. Morris, as you have, it's, it's rare to come across someone who has not been a mentee of Mr. Larry Morris. But, you know, we've come to a place in philanthropy. So I'm a philanthropist. You know, we all are. We're doing what we do for the love of humanity. That's why we're here. You can do that from any seat, any position, be it corporate, be it law enforcement, you know, be it a for-profit company that you started, you don't have to work for a, a IRS recognized 501c3 organization. On the, the, other, the other misnomer is that um, you just have to be a volunteer and you're not gonna become, you know, rich. With all due respect, there's a phrase called poverty pimping and it is very, very real. One of the highest paid people in the state of Delaware is not the chief of police, it's not, you know, a, a VP. It is a nonprofit executive director that we all know. You know, we're talking about triple six figures. You know, $300,000 and up is, is her annual salary. I just want to let you know, there, there's some, a, a nonprofit that started. Um, there are hundreds and th of thousands of dollars millions of dollars just in Delaware, and this is really public information, Philanthropy Delaware, Delaware um, Community Foundation, you can Google this very easily, but millions and millions and millions annually are being doled out to people who are professing to do work um, in communities of color. And 95% of that money is not being given to community leaders of color and, and people who are uniquely qualified to do this work. Um, not that you can't do this work unless you're a person of color, but there's such injustice even in how that works. But for the youth who are listening or for anyone who's like, yes, I, I have a calling on my life. I know there's a purpose, but I got to choose between paying my bills and fulfilling my purpose. That's a dangerous, dangerous message. And children continue to die because people are so afraid to make the impact and fulfill the calling on their life 
because they think they can't pay their bills. I bought my house. My, first of all, I didn't start a nonprofit. I started a for-profit company and that's how I started making my impact. From my for-profit company, I started One Village Alliance. So as my own first foundation to fund my work, I bought my house my very first year as a young black girl business owner who'd never even written a grant before. Now I do grant, not only grant writing trainings, but grant winning trainings. Um, I, I have a vehicle, the car that I want to drive of my dream. So, so please don't think, you know, my son, I put him through college. He has zero debt. We have everything that we could want and need. We travel often. Mostly I travel the world for my work, but it's an amazing life when you're walking in your purpose. And, and I, I want to, I want to just say that you can find real wealth, like real wealth when you really answer that calling, if, if you know you have a calling on your life and you can find it in any space, in any business that you're in. That is awesome. You know, uh, right. earlier, uh, I would certainly agree awesome. with that because at the Academy for Peace, one of the programs that we offer is called RICH, R-I-C-H, Realizing Independence, Creativity, and Happiness. Because the uh, your purpose is always greater than your position. And yeah. when you can operate in your purpose, as Chandra just said, the rest will come. Yeah. Do not believe the hype. These nonprofit leaders out here are getting rich in every sense of the word off of young, black, poor kids and families staying poor off of violence, staying violent. So the work that we have to do, and the only way to bring accountability to this work that we're doing is by getting in this space and, um, and being a part of this work. There's a lot of, no argument, there is a lot of money in, in this work. And there are a lot of people that sit back and complain, but they don't, they don't do anything about it. They don't get involved. They don't try to make change. They don't try to do anything. They just sit back and complain and take pot shots at, at, at programs and individuals. And, um, and, and, you know, we need people to actually care about the community. This, this kind of work, to make impact, you have to care. You have to care. And particularly when you work with children and, and poor folks. Children and poor folks know right away whether you're sincere or not and whether or not they want to be a part of you, whether they want to be around you. They've been they've been hoodwinked for so long. Yeah. By these by these pretend programs and pretend people. Poverty pimps. Um, yes. Yeah. And and so when you try to help them, they don't know whether they want to talk to you or not. Yeah. You know, because you might be just like one of the, the others. And and so we have, so so when when it's your calling, you have to be willing to talk to anybody about anything, you know, because you know because it it could mean a lot. Now let me let me give you a really good example, um, Dr. J. You all got involved because of that incident that happened in the barbershop, and everybody wow. knows about that. Well. And, and I was part of ones, oh my gosh, this is just awful. This is just awful. They should really get those guys that did that, et cetera, et cetera. Well, several months later, I got a letter from the guy who drove the car. Mm -hmm. And I had had him when I worked at Ferris. Mm -hmm. And his heart was breaking. He's in jail and he's writing me a letter. And he's telling me how he's so sorry. He just, his heart is, he, he, first of all, he's saying he has let me down. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. sorry. Yeah. He's so sorry for the family. He's so sorry. So, you know, of course that melted my heart and I started a dialogue with this young man and, and, you know, he, he served time in prison and he's out now and he's, he's, he's doing well in the community. He's, he takes an active stand in things that are going on in the community. So, we can't judge. I mean, the, we have to be open. We don't know what the circumstances are that cause people to be poor. 
We don't know the circumstances that cause little uh, or children to be delinquent or to be to, for adults to commit crime. We just don't know the whole story and we have to be open. And whether or not, and because here, here's the other thing, how we treat individuals as we, as we come along, as we meet them, they spread the word. You know, they either say, you shouldn't deal with Larry Morris. He, he, he doesn't mean what he says. You know, he'll 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 string you along in other, or he'll say, Larry it's Morris is the person you should call. Yeah. And and that's how you people begin to open up to people that really need help. They're not sure they need help. The day that they feel like, realize they need help, they want to talk to somebody that can help. That's sincere. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is a good point because uh, when we would go into the detention centers, the young people, and they would see me, they would talk to me as if I were their grandmother. Mm -hmm. And you make a very good point. Every person that we meet in this work, we have to show them through the way we receive them that they are valuable parts of community. And that and, we respect these. And that we, exactly. And that's why we have that in our mission to recreate a safe community by promoting respect and positive values. And so I never forget that. That is what I want to be about. That is what I want to offer to our youngsters growing up now, that yes. they can be all that they can be and that there is a way already paid for them. And Chandra, you said something, I believe that's important as well. And I think Larry mentioned it too. When you're doing this work, I liken it unto the gospel. It's the good news that there is a better way. Absolutely. Of doing something and presenting something. And if we can just do that, we mind that, listen, you don't have to be the CEO. You don't have to be the preacher behind the pulpit. Right. You don't have to be the community worker getting paid. Just do you with a heart of compassion. Yeah. And the rest will come. It's like Go ye and just tell somebody. Each one read one, each one teach one. Everybody tells somebody. And eventually, peace grows from that. Absolutely. You know, I want to, um, to Dr. J and, and to Sandra in, in particular, um, you two, uh, you, you have your own buildings now. Um, and Dr. J, I've, I've been in your building on, on numerous occasions. And I, and I watch you feed people food. I watch you allow people who didn't have money, who didn't have money to do to rent a facility where they can come in and say if they, if they have someone to give you, they can give it to you. If they don't have it, you can still use it this facility. Uh, you have an open door policy as well as Sandra. I, I watched Sandra when she was in a church in South Branch and she was on Washington Street. Now now she has her own building. So I want to ask you too, how does it feel? How did it feel when you got your own building? Because now you you, you can operate as long as you, you want to do. You don't you don't have to worry about getting out rushing out six o'clock. Or, or, or waiting for this, or waiting for that. I mean, you can come in any time. Yeah. Just talking about just, just having your own building, and then also talking about um, having your doors open. You, you, you're a safe haven for, for, for the community. Uh, we'll start off with Sandra and Dr. J. Mm, you want to start with me? I, I'll be honest. You know, a building's a building structure do, doesn't excite me. Um, building community really does. So we've never put a lot of resources into a building. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, you know, there's something unique about our organization's approach to community engagement. And a lot of people don't realize it, but our goal was not to have a building as a part of our founding mission. Um, it was to leverage existing resources in the heart of communities that need us the most. So this barrier of transportation, can people get there? 
you know, when I started this work, I was shopping for a building. It's you, like when you want to start a community organization, the first thing you think you need is a building. And someone said to me, Chandra, there's all these buildings out here. And I realized I went through Wilmington and there's all these great missions, all these organizations, all these great programs on the brochures and on the website. But then you go into the building and it's empty. There's no one who can really reach into that community. Transportation is a barrier. Families don't know about the programs. You know, how are they gonna get there? We all go to these meetings and now we're on Zooms day and night where we're talking to each other about our great work and our great, great programs, but there's such a barrier between communities and children and those most in need getting there. So we never took that approach. If we build it, they will come we wanted to come directly to community. So we have five key partners and this is across the, the globe where we work. It's um, public schools, well, any school, of course. So we wanna go right where kids are. I mean, if the school closes at three o'clock, here's this empty building with heat, air and lights, you know, right where we need to literally meeting them where they are. So schools are a partner, public libraries are a partner, um, faith-based, you know, organ faith-based um, um, partners or churches, maybe one or two days a week, but they have these sprawling campuses and building. That's why we've, we've always been in churches. Um, uh, Low-income housing communities, every HUD-funded property, be it public housing or privately owned public, you know, projects or, or low-income housing, they must have a community center as a part of the blueprint to get funded. Okay. However, that's the end of the law. They don't have to do any program there. So nine times out of 10, any um, low income housing always has a community center. Nine times out of 10, it's empty. It's not, um, there's no programming happening there. And then we're in every institute in the city of Wilmington where youth are incarcerated. So facilities where youth are incarcerated, a captive audience, right? So we break down any barriers and th those are our partners and we do have round the clock access we've always had to our facilities. I mean, of course, if it's a library or public school, not so much, but we've always had those spaces, you know, be it um, Grace Church and, you know, the low income housing facilities, we have full reign and access. We have a lease type agreement, but um, it, it's a shared investment. So we're not spending any dollars on rent, mortgage, lights, even maintenance in any cases. That's all a part of our contract. And 100% of every dime that comes into One Village Alliance goes directly toward programming and, and staffing our programs. Um, but to the Freedom Center, it's an amazing 10,000 square foot space. It was a huge undertaking. Any building is. We, I, my staff called me just before this call started that there's a, a the roof is leaking. So um, there's always these things that have to be considered with a facility, but we have a lot of support. It's an amazing state of the art facility. Yeah, it's 24 seven, you know, access. We're able to be a greater resources to a greater resource to house um, small business owners. We have back office space. We have a state of the art culinary arts center and commercial kitchen for caterers or food trucks, anyone who wants to get into that space, but because of, you know, um, discriminatory lending can't get a loan to start their own. We give them a good starting place. We do all kind of workshops and trainings. We have a uh, COVID safe space for convening in person and meeting, which we've been doing all throughout the pandemic. We provide 2,500 meals to um, people in need every single week. So uh, this building, we're, we're um, developing a performing arts center, but again, we're, we have to remember to intentionally on purpose, constant, consciously remain outward reaching. It's not about a One Village Alliance building or Chandra's building. You know, that's why we call it freedom. We wanna invite everyone to freedom, every business owner. We house mission aligned organizations there if we have a shared mission. So we're all, um, you know, taking on this heavy lift together. Um, so it, it's truly, truly a community space and we're just as outward reaching. And when the world opens back up, we want to go back into those schools, Ferris, Snowden, Moles, Grace, the public libraries. Um, we want to continue to be based in every community. We got a call today, a 15 year old kid needs tutoring. I mean, he's on the verge of dropping out and it's a condition of his probation. He has, you know, he's not getting the support he needs on this Zoom school. But the, you know, we're on the north side, you know, and, and this kid may or may not be affiliated. It may or may not be safe for our kids to cross community lines. So we have to go 
into those communities with the full armor of our purpose. We, we, we've got to stop just attaching our work to a building or a warehouse. That that's just not the nature of true community impact. Dr. J, Academy for Peace. I can say ditto to everything she said because when Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated started, we started as just a response to what we saw happening that was horrific. And so we started at Easy in Mount Carmel, United Methodist Church on Walnut Street. And we reached out into the community surrounding the church, which was the uh, Wiener properties. And from that, we started all of our programming. We went into the detention centers. All of our meetings were held in every center in the city, every community center. You remember that, Larry. You remember that, Chandra. And so everything that Chandra just said is something that Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated believes wholeheartedly that it's in the community. People may not realize, but realize this, but I still go into the schools. All of our programs are offered in the libraries, the rich yeah. program. All of our programs are offered at the community centers. I go into private schools. I do diversity, facilitation, peace, mediation. <laughs> Anything that's necessary to fulfill our mission of promoting peace, respect, and positive values, we're there doing that outside the walls of 203 North Market Street. Now, Absolutely. am I glad to have 203 North Market Street? Well, I can say yes to that, but as a philanthropist, as I am as well, yeah. My delight is to be able to give back because I've truly been blessed. And so a lot of it is my desire to do that. But it's also a team effort. It takes many hands to do this work in a way that I say many hands make short work because it isn't always easy. People don't realize the magnitude of what you do all the time because they don't see it. But it's there and you know what it takes to get it done. And so I'm thankful that we have the building, but we are outreach focused. We are go ye into the world. Mm -hmm. um, Stop the Violence Coalition had a presence and still does after COVID, we pray. Uh, you know, we are tri-state. We have done conferences in Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, wherever we are called. We have a full program that we can take just about anywhere doing just about any number of things mm -hmm. to promote peace. And another thing, uh, Mr. Omar, you've been there. We are rarely, if ever, when open before COVID. We never have a dark time at, <laughs> at 203 <laughs> North Market. We are there. We're there for the homeless that walk past going to the Sunday breakfast mission, where I learned a lot about compassion. Mm -hmm because I was there for seven years as the Sunday minister. People don't know that. Wow, I didn't so know that. I wrote programs, uh, a program called Maximize Manhood. So any of the men coming by, they're welcome at the Academy for Peace. Uh, in the prison system, we go in. We have a program called PrEP, Pre-Release Empowerment Program. In the schools, we offer GLAM, which is Glowing Ladies Attitude Models, promoting the right attitude. They send me all of the girls who are those who have uh, what they would say would be a bad attitude. <laughs> and we look at them as young ladies just needing to know who they are. And we call them 
Queens with our um, pageant program. So there are many, many things that we can do inside the building, but that's just the place to hang our hat because the work is out there. Wherever out there is, is where we have been, where we are and where we are going to stay. Because people are hurting. And after COVID, Chandra and Mr. Larry, get ready because the work is just beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. And we've been doing the work, you and I, Dr. J, all through COVID. You know I'm it. I'm so excited to have you in this work with me. Thank you so much. And as well, you know, you got something we're, we're working on, going to be working on. I I'm excited. About it. And, and that's another thing. You know, people, and we have to be really careful about this. Don't presuppose that there's any kind of rift between those who can be meaningful partners to reach the community. Because every hand is needed on deck. And so if you can't find something to do, seek us out and find out what you can help us do. Every job I've ever had, and I've had some wonderful, wonderful opportunities from government to banking to religion, you name it. I probably had a little <laughs> taste of it, but every job started with volunteering. Yes. And I like to teach young people to volunteer because that volunteering led me to an entrepreneurial, spirit, I call it, where I'm an entrepreneur. And it also led me to get good jobs because I had experience from volunteering. So I'd like to uh, impress upon young people, don't rule out volunteering because that might be the door, your foot in the door. You know, um, Sandra, I want to ask you, um, I was thinking about this as I was preparing for the show. You had a vision, uh, One Village Alliance. And, and one of the things that just struck me is that through your vision of, of building such an awesome organization, you have created jobs for people. I mean, this pandemic, people are losing jobs. I mean, you're hiring counselors, you're hiring mentors, you're hiring teachers or whoever else you may be hiring. So have you ever just sat back and said to yourself, wow, this, this vision that I created I'm bringing people jobs. <laughs> You're gonna bring me to tears, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> Every time I turn that key, you know, I am so, I live in such extreme gratitude and that's what I, you know, hinted to when I say you can find true wealth in your purpose, whatever it is, man. To be able to not only employ, I mean, we've employed 13 new individuals just during the pandemic. Um, 11 of the, I, I'm sorry, well more than that, you know, we, we've employed about 28, 28 individuals. Now, 25 of those individuals worked with us all summer. Um, and out of those, you know, 28 individuals, 25 have been youth employees from um, high poverty households. Mm -hmm. And we were able to employ those youth not only to give them, you know, a job, but a safe haven, somewhere to be, a mental health support network around them. These are our Freedom Fellows. But at $11 an hour, many of them became immediately the highest earning um, worker in their household. In their household, yeah. So, so not just employing them with a minimum wage, you know, um, fast food job, which is very valuable, but a real meaningful work experience where they're training, they're CEOs and training, they're activists and philanthropists, and they know these words, they know what they're training for. They are getting volunteer experience. They're giving out brand new winter coats um, to people who are cold and brand new prom dresses. They understand the value and respect that we're not, you know, the, there's a lot of value in use, but I'm just saying we, you know, they get to develop and, and, and respect the communities that they come from and serve those communities. Um, and then the adults, you know, I have a, a I have to shout out, um, well, I'll, 
um, you know, there's a young woman who's going through a career change, you know, and at a, as a middle age, you know, late in life. And she's so excited. She's always wanted to do community work. She hates her job and she hated, you know, her job. And finally she said, um, you know, just give me the, give me the, a reason and the power and a opportunity to walk out. And for the first time, you know, um, at 46 years old, she did, awesome. and, and she's my newest hire. She just was awesome. in all day yesterday for an orientation. You know, um, my community impact curator, he would just come into work every day, and, you know, his his saying was flat, flat, because he knows, like, the angels are so present in the space. So not only giving people jobs, Brother Omar, but really giving them an extraordinary opportunity, not an easy opportunity, but an extraordinary opportunity to really change the world and feel that change happening during every single shift that they step into that, that they step into freedom. So I, I'm really grateful. I'm excited. I could not be more thankful. And, you know, like Larry and Dr. J said, I could not be doing anything else. Just, I just right. couldn't. You know, Sam, so you missed it earlier. Right. You mentioned the Black Panther Party. Uh, the, the movie that's that's hot right now is um, the Black uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, uh, a documentary on Frank Henry Jr. and Wim O'Neill. Um, Mr. Morris and uh, Dr. J, um, do, do you guys growing up in the 60s, do, 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 do you two remember Fred Hampton? Do, do, do you remember the Black Panther Party? Uh, what, what were your thoughts on, on them? Let's start from Mr. Uh, Mr. Morris. Of course. Uh... When I started at Goldie Beacom at 18 years old, Goldie Beacom was a business school and you had to wear a suit and coat and a tie every day. Mm -hmm. And so when I started working with the young people and uh, there were reports in the newspaper and on the news and so forth about the Black Panthers and, and a couple other, a few other activists, it was, it was Black men who had beards. So I stopped shaving at Goldie Beacom and my accounting teacher said, made an announcement that he wasn't letting anybody else come into the class if they weren't clean shaven. And uh, a because I'm thinking I'm getting ready to get put out of school <laughs> um, <laughs> because I'm not going to shave. And so, because that's all the image of black men were being arrested and they were negative if they had beards and so forth, if they were even on at all. Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah, so, so, and, and then, then I had a, um, I wore, I wore black militant boots and, and a green uh, army jacket everywhere. As soon as I came out of class with my coat and ties off, I put on my uniform. <laughs> I remember you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then when I left, when I went, left uh, Goldie Beacom, it was a two year school then, I went straight to Lincoln University to, um, to study sociology so I could really work with young people. And while I was on campus, there was a person named Spider-Man. Spider-Man was a really vivid, vivid, vocal, charismatic leader. Everybody knew who he was. He, he staged a, a, a march. If you know where Lincoln is, Lincoln is Oxford. It's near there. And Oxford was a little country racist town. They were going to march. Spider-Man had everybody um, organized to march from Lincoln to Oxford. And they, and they called it off. The police and everybody to call up. Guess who Spider-Man was? Who, you? No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Spider Man. Spider Man was Gil Scott Heron. I remember uh, that. Yes. And so here I was on campus with, with you know, activists like that, and and through uh, uh, a, a, a relationship that I that I uh, made, had at the time, um, this young lady li worked worked in Germ I lived in Germantown, and she was also active. So I began to work in the. Um, the Saturday school, the Black Panthers had a s Saturday breakfast program in school there in Germantown, and so I worked for a while there. So I certainly knew 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 all of you know all of that. And uh, you know Malcolm X, as much as people say you know they quote Malcolm and everything like that, everybody did not like Malcolm. Absolutely. All black people. I'm talking about black people. <laughs> of course, the they white don't 
appreciate us till we're gone. We got black <laughs> leaders so, among us right now. Yeah. So yeah, I was, I was, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. J, remember when um, the young lady got shot for stealing a peach? That was my cousin. Yeah, I mean, we, we had a match. Yeah. And Rap I unfortunately can't remember her name right now. Uh, it'll come to me, but this, yeah. year, this young lady. Well, one of my relatives told me about her. Her name was Sheila Farrell. Sheila Farrell. Sheila Farrell. Sheila Sheila Farrell. Farrell. Yes. Yeah, this white man, friend. this white man shot her, you know, somewhere around, uh, not northeast over by the projects, over Market Street, over that way somewhere. Yeah, okay. across so the street. west side of Market. Yeah, I mean, he shot her. He shot her and killed her. Uh, mm -hmm. there, was a, there was marches and so forth then. And um, so, yeah, the Black Panthers, uh, you know, I say, I say to, today, and in and, and, and America's in, we, we owe a, 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 a real crazy kind of debt of gratitude to Donald Trump. Yes, we do. I was because, second that notion, yes. Larry. Because crazy white folks have always existed in America. These, these yeah. proud boys and KKK and all these other, they've always existed. They've always been here. Because, but because their target was us. White people didn't, didn't, bother, they didn't bother them at all. They didn't bother them. Donald Trump made it so that they felt it was safe to come out, come out of the cloud. Yes. So, so where we're working, we're working all around white folks that were affiliated with the KKK mm -hmm. and these other crazy radical groups. We didn't know who they were. Now we know exactly who, who they are. And who they so, are. Yeah, we know who they are. We know where they are. And so, yeah. so, so, so I use this. So, so, so here you, at one point in America, you had the Black Panthers and you had the Ku Klux Klan. The Black Panthers promoted uh, safe communities, uh, uh, schools, medicine. Food for children. Food and all that. The, and that's what people don't realize. The, the Klan, the Klan yeah. They openly say their, their whole existence that they don't like Jews, black folks, and anybody else. Their whole existence is based on yeah. murder, destruction. On, on, and hate and murder. Hate. Okay, okay, so what happened in America was that J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, the Klansman. targeted the Black Panthers for elimination. Yeah. They do a daggone thing to the Ku Klux Klan. So he systematically assassinated leaders in the Black Panthers till they yeah. Basically, they were gone. They, they were gone. And the Klan, they didn't do one thing to the Klan. Uh, <coughs> we grew up during that time, and um, you know, and, it, and it's uh, there were little 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 groups you know around town, uh, you know, uh, that 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 were kind of militant groups that patterned stuff out the Black Panthers, you know, small small youth groups and like that. But the new Black Panthers, Blacky yeah. Black. Man, Blacky for, blacks, for, Blacky for blacks. During that time, boy. And during that during that time, you had such thing. We we were becoming aware. It was right after um, uh, Dr. King and Malcolm were, were killed, and and prior to that, black folks didn't say a whole lot. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. folks weren't militant. You know, they kind of you know, white folks are saying if you just if you just lay low and 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 and, and act like Americans, you know, you'll get what you want. And you, you know, yeah. but, and so we realized that that's not true at all. And so, so, so now, in, in, in you know, right at that time, the the um, and then then Muhammad Ali decided he wasn't going to go to Vietnam, and he, so you had brothers who was who were not going for the draft. They were getting drafted, but yeah. they were going to the draft, or they go to to basic training and then come home for for a visit <laughs> and stay home. And yeah. so police were targeting people in 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 the west side and the east side. Uh, uh, you know who. Y'all know Balagoon? Yeah. Balagoon, what the heck is his real name? Uh, but Balagoon is, is around now and uh, he, he got arrested for draft uh, evasion and all over the city, you have si see signs that free Balagoon. And, and, and then Jackie Stiggers was the president of Blacky Blacks and and he he came home on, on leave and didn't go back. And the police are always looking for these to these guys who had affiliations with, with militant kind of uh, behavior. Now the only affiliated groups we have in Wilmington are these kids killing each other. 
Well, they're the only, there's still that white supremacy. Those groups exist very heavily here, but um, that's why this book is so important, Larry, that you're going to put out, you know, these, these, <laughs> we need to tell them who we are. You need to tell them who you are, who these groups were, who these great leaders, leaders were who grew up right in the East side, West side, North side. Um, yeah. yeah. So and they can the, yeah, see who they are. And, yeah, and, and they also need to know, just as you've said, that when we hear about Black Panthers, yeah. we're not talking about a group that started out. They were created to yeah. be what we hear about. But yeah. they started out as a very social movement, civic-minded, doing great things in the community but they were portrayed to be other than that. And so I think, just as I said before, you gotta tell the real story. Yes. You tell the and real you, story. And, and if you know somebody what, tells you who they are, like Maya Angelou said, believe, believe them. Believe. So what's happening in this movement and in this light is people are showing who they really are. Yeah, and it's America has has been forced to look in the mirror. I mean, I don't know how you, you couldn't see it before, but definitely these last four years, I think we've come a very long way and, in making sure the veil is is lifted off the the ugly face of America and racism. And, and see, America, the, the the at the root of America's problems was that America, that white folks looked at America as their country. Yeah. Everybody else, they, the rules didn't apply to everybody else. All men are created equal, meant white men. Absolutely. You know, it didn't mean y'all. And, 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 and so, and so, so they believed that everything belonged to them. Jobs belonged to them. Yeah. Good houses belonged to them. Schools, the best schools belonged to them. And so mm -hmm. our, our, our growth was suppressed. Yeah. The, the, more you, the more you started, we started being able to flex our muscles and saying, the hell with them. Yeah. You don't really want to be, we don't want what you're going to give us. You know, here comes James Brown saying, we, Say it now. <laughs> don't want you, we don't want you to give us anything. Just open the door. That's all we're asking. Don't give us anything. Mm -hmm. And now, so different talent started 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 being developed, and the and the and the strength in our community was that it. This is our community. This is yeah. on a street wide. Look, I told you I lived in a Y. Okay, when I would go into the community, people I would say I live in the Y, and they would say the black Y or the white Y. Wow. <laughs> and, um, Absolutely, Walnut Street. Uh, what do you mean? Life. You know, and that's right. So Walnut Street, because and now I, I just did this uh, Black History uh, moment on Walnut Street Y, and 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 the Walnut Street Y, they're on the east side, the Walnut Street Y and Howard High School, and everything kind of spun around French Street and Walnut Street Y, and and and, uh, and and Howard High School. And so there was a big sense of, of, uh, of, of uh, talent and leadership and strength. Senator Holloway and Lewis Redding, they all met there at the YMCA. Uh, if a teacher with a PhD came to Delaware to teach at Howard and didn't have his residence in place, he lived at the Walnut Street YMCA. Wow. And so the, the, the strength and character was just there overflowing, overflowing, over. And, and so now we kind, we're kind of spread out and, and we don't have, you know, sometimes our leadership is not projecting the right, the right, uh, the right vibe. And so yeah. we, we have to go back and bring our, our young people and say, this is what's for our community. This is what's the pride. We're not gonna let you do this over here and we're not gonna let you do this over here. And, and, and we're gonna build, we're gonna build, we're gonna love, we're gonna love, we're gonna build and, and, and grow. Everybody's gonna grow. Yeah. And you know, Larry, you, you, you're right on point because I think of the People Settlement Association. What a vibrant entity that was during those days. And, and now 
we've really lost some of the icons and the monuments, if you will, of our illustrious history, especially around uh, Walnut Street and going back through the east side. That's where our um, teachers live. That's where our yeah. dentists and our psychologists yeah. live. Yeah. That's well, well, it is under full-blown gentrification right now, and we oh. can be a part of that, and it's vital that we do, because those properties are being taken and given. Oh, yeah, um, I've been noticing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, noticing. very subtly and quietly, but it's mm -hmm. all white men. It, 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 ha it has not changed. Mm -hmm. It's just very subtle and quiet, but, you know, this is well, why this information is so important, <clears throat> so that we can be a part of... Um, you know, if we're still Black history in the making, if we're still the great leaders, this is this is the story. You know, Dr. King said the greatest um, tragedy that have to be recorded during our time of social transition is not the strident climber of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. What we do and don't do will be recorded in history. So it's, that's why it's so important to live in our true greatness as we're raising up generations and communities and people to be great. We got to be great first. Right. And if we don't learn how to love, we will perish. Yeah, and sometimes That's being right. great means being radical. You know, look up the word radical. I'm gonna just let y'all Google it. And there's nothing wrong with being <laughs> radical, Larry, like you said. I mean, I would have loved to live through those times, but these are just as important times and we need those kind of leaders and that kind of energy right now, so. And it's an important time for, for black folks to be strong. Absolutely. In order for America to grow and to be great for everybody, this whole business about make it great again, exactly. Tell us exactly when it was great. Ever. Okay. <laughs> so now in order to make America great, white folks are gonna have to listen to the truth and there's gonna be some feelings hurt because white folks have been some real treacherous, diabolical, <laughs> You know, folks, you know, just, just look what we're talking about on the east side. So you had the Wall Street while you had Howard. That, here, here comes August Quarterly. Yeah. And, and okay, August Quarterly started down at, 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 at like 12th and French and ended up at the train station mm -hmm. with tens of thousands of people all the time or every year, including, you know, uh, you know Harry Tubman would come. So, so here was this great thing, and on French Street, you had the Monday Club, you had you had um, doctors' offices and lawyers' offices. Mother Church was on French Street, and 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 Easy and Church was on French Street, and so and so all of a sudden they decide they're gonna uh, uh, re, uh, make the city nice or this new plans. Yeah. Think now. Guess what street does not go all the way to the train station. French, French Street. They cut that stuff right off. Wow. Only they cut that. We're gonna we're gonna fix all those Negroes. We're, yeah. We're just gonna chop it in half. They can't have that much power. So yeah. so there weren't any plans for a hotel or or the, or the, or the ju justice center or nothing like that. Those were open lots for years and years and years because there wasn't any plan. The plan was to shut off the black activity. So yeah. all of a sudden, Mother Church moves to someplace else. Easy and church moves to someplace else. The doctor's office are going someplace, and now French Street is just a street. Yeah. You know, Sandra. Um, you know, we talked about uh, the, the '60s with the Black Black Panther Party. So, in our days, we, we got Black Lives Matter. Uh, just a couple of minutes. What, what are your thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement? Black Lives Matter is, you know, an, an affirmative. It's um, it's something that needs to be said, and. It's unfortunate that it needs to be said. It wouldn't be a fight, you know, if white people were leading it. Like, let's talk about if if white people would just acknowledge that Black Lives Matter. Um, but but we need to continue to affirm that, you know, this this work is about humanity. But if we go back to the beginning of the Constitution, we don't need an amendment. We need to burn the Constitution, put it through a paper shredder and call all people what we are, a full human being. We're living in a nation that, doesn't, that does not acknowledge black people 
as human beings and as a human society, everyone needs to affirm that black lives do matter. It's very interesting what's happening in the Asian community right now. Um, some, some Asian guy posted a hashtag because of a black man and a lot of black people are standing in solidarity with the Asian community for, um, you know, there's, there's this brutality happening against Asians. But my question is when has the Asian community ever stood in solidarity just be, with, with black people, with, with black people as a whole, you know, when has that happened? So black people are such loving people by nature. Um, and here we are on the streets having to affirm that Black Lives Matter. But again, with the with the 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 uprising of a Trump nation, one of the things that I was most just compelled by that happened in 2020 was humanity rising to affirm that Black Lives Matter. You know, unfortunately, um, for the first time ever, and I know we can go back to the Evan Pettus Bridge and well, there were white people. That was after the slaughter that white people came to that bridge, you know, for the photo ops. Um, and and not that, you know, it was you know, all white people are against us and for the oppression, but the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the Black Lives Matter affirmation, it, it needs to continue to be said, unfortunately, and Asian people need to be saying it, white people need to be saying it. It's the, uh, Yes. humanity needs to be saying it but first and foremost the constitution of the united states of america needs to be destroyed and rewritten to recognize that human lives matter uh, equally and that we are all human beings now we can at this point approach it with equality there has to be some real equity including reparations and and a lot of other things but um it needs to be affirmed at every level of community even right here in delaware where you're talking about the east side community and now, you know, we're, we're living under a government locally here in Wilmington that won't even put lights in that community or resources or public safety. You go down to the riverfront or to Market Street um, and you've, you've got police officers on every single block. There's no public safety plan for the east side community, Walnut Street and, and farther east. You know, there's no lighting, there's no safety plan, there's no, you know, you talk about the, the people settlement. That was our very first office. I don't know if you guys are our very first place of this is the perfect place, but we just couldn't thrive and do any work there. And um, those resources need to be um, poured into our communities even today. So this is not historic oppression we're talking about. This is modern day oppression. And we need to modern day continue to say, even right here in the city of Wilmington and across the state, that hey, Black lives do matter. Like, you do know that, right? Okay, so we're, we're coming to a close. This is an outstanding conversation. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to give each one of you just just, just one minute because we're going to close out. Does have any closing comments? Uh, if you have any events, uh, how can people contact you? So let's start off with Dr. J. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to be included in this illustrious body tonight. That's the first thing I want to say is, again, you've pulled together uh, some voices that have made a difference throughout uh, our community. And I'm just glad to be in the number. Thank you so much, Chandra, for thank always, you. always being such a voice of uh, wisdom. and. Um, I honor you and Mr. Larry Morris. What can I say about you? You remember our midnight talks about the city <laughs> and what to do for children. So we all are in this together. Yeah. And I'm glad about that. Uh, the Academy for Peace is alive and well. And uh, this Saturday, we have our first uh, live activity. Uh, we've been on Zoom and we've been in the streets, but we will <coughs> be in the building this coming Saturday at one o'clock. Ladies, stop in. Gentlemen, come on in as well. And there will be something for everybody and uh, warm up with some tea because that's what I do, and it's my business. <laughs> okay, Dr. J, what's the, what's the address? It's 203 
North Market Street. I just had to have a little levity there. You know how I do. But I just think that the work is being cut out for us, as my mother would say. She said, you got your work cut out for you. And I believe that we are in the midst of a time and a season when our calling is being heard loud and clear. So stay true to your calling, my colleagues in this work. Okay, Mr. Morris, one minute. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we, we need community activism more than ever. Um, our young people, uh, you know, I, 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 all young people by definition are immature. They, they don't know how to make wise decisions. They need older people around them to help them make wise decisions. And, and, and in the past, it's been the families. So it's the families. It was my family that kept me from acting crazy. Mm. It, it always is in my head to act crazy. I just didn't act out on it. I was afraid of my mom. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but today's children, they don't, have, they don't have families like we used to have. They don't have teachers like we used to have. They don't have coaches like we used to have. And they don't have social programs like we used to have. So, so we are blaming them when, in fact, they're the victims. And so if we're going to grow, if we're going to grow as a community, um, we have to have adult role models who are doing the work, who are doing the business, but they're role models. They were helping to develop the next generation. And we were helping, there are people who are activists who are putting the pressure on the powers to be to make sure that the families and the children and the communities get, get what they're supposed to get. So we have an obligation. If we're gonna run for office, then we, we, we have to be selfless. If we're gonna be community activists, we, we've gotta be selfless. We've got to be in it for the right reasons, and we got to show show the right example all the time. So we're motivating everyone to to move together. Let's move together. They can't hold us back if we're there's nothing they can do to stop us from moving forward if we're moving together. Okay, Sandra, what's your website and phone number? And are you still hiring? <laughs> they can't kill us all, Larry. They can kill each one of us, but they can't kill us all. So stand together and, yeah. and, and be courageous. I am the village.org. That's I A M the village.org. Another important affirmation. It truly does take a whole village to raise a child. And together we are that village uh, freedom. Uh, we invite you all to freedom. It's located at 31 West 31st street. Amazing things happening in that facility every single day, COVID compliant. We have a legacy um, twin B a television production studio uh, at Freedom. Mm -hmm. We've got the group violence intervention uh, agency housed there. We have a black martial arts school led by a phenomenal young teenage girl who is a black belt and Dr. Idris Clymer, who is the, um, the sensei there. And that's, um, we've got a social justice circles every single Monday. We have an art studio and gallery that engages youth in, um, mural arts, art on clothing, redesigning sneakers. It's, it's some really dope work happening there. But most importantly, we are working towards social justice in our local community, um, statewide, nationally, and around the world. We have a Silent No More March coming up on March uh, 2nd at 2.30 p.m. Follow Mamas Behind the Masses. That's our criminal justice page that is led by families um, who, have, who are being impacted by massive incarceration and the in, injustice therein. So um, again, you can find out a lot of information by following our social media pages, the number one in the word village on Instagram, One Village Alliance right here on Facebook and visiting our website. You can contribute, you can get involved, you can get your ch children involved. Um, one person can and will make a difference and that one person could be you. I am the village.org. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. So I thank everybody for, for, for being a guest. This is an awesome show. It's on the real quick, what's the hours of operation? We're there till eight o'clock at night, just about every night. So nine in the morning to 8 p.m. 
but we've got Saturday events happening, nighttime events. We just did a phenomenal day of service, uh, Martin Luther King Week of Action. We have a lot of things going on and we're a really amazing event space. So if you have an idea, a program for outreach, a family event that you wanna host, reach out to us. You can also reach us at 855 youth E-D. That's 855-Y-O-U-T-H-E-D. Okay, everybody. So thank you for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and share. And um, God bless. Have a safe week. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, so Brother much. Omar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye, colleagues. <laughs> <laughs>